left alone. Uh, for those of you who are not here for the first part earlier, my name is uh, Alain Philippe Durand, and uh, uh, we're very happy to welcome uh, French novelist Marie Dariussec. There was a first uh, presentation last night uh, in English, a more formal uh, introduction and pre uh, presentation and lecture. So today it's uh, already an opportunity for uh, for all of us to, to dialogue together and ask any questions, uh, any comments you would like to uh, to, to make. We had a, uh, another session in French uh, earlier today that some of you attended, and uh, so we'll see you know where the, the discussion takes us. But uh, for those of you who are joining us for the for the first time, uh, just a quick reminder that uh, we are here at the University of Arizona, the, the host of the. And thanks to Mary and her publisher, uh, the host of the Marie Dariusek website, uh, dariusek.arizona.edu. And uh, since 2001, Marie Dariusek and her publisher have uh, worked uh, in collaboration with me and my students, uh, first at the University of Rhode Island and uh, since 2010 at the University of Arizona. So if some of you are interested in uh, collaborating with the website, you're more than welcome to, to do so. And can get in touch with me. You do not have to know French to do that because the, the website has two versions, one in French and one in English. And uh, one thing I forgot to say uh, in the previous uh, session but I, that I did say last night, there is a book display uh, at the... Hello, we just started. So, hey, here he is. Hey, Brace. Hey, guys. Oh, wow. Okay, we got the whole team. So, we're <laughs> back. We can uh, work here. We were talking about for the airport thing, so now that all of you guys are here, we can work here this afternoon. All right. Thank you. So, uh, yes, there is at the UA Bookstore, uh, there is a display, a book display of uh, the, all the works by Marie Dariusek that have been translated into English, and there are several copies available there if you would be interested in uh, purchasing them. And it's by the, the display uh, is at the customer service desk by the Starbucks, the one that is by the Starbucks, so they have like all of our books there, so I encourage you to take a look. And for those of you who are uh, new here, uh, just to let you know that uh, the, the book that uh, was translated in more than 40 languages that uh, Marie uh, wrote was uh, uh, Pig Tales, a novel of uh, Lost and Translation. That's uh, uh, Yes, uh, uh, <laughs> Transformation, which created the sensation when it, uh, when it came out. And uh, so, uh, so, you know, uh, this one, of course, uh, and others are available at, uh, at, uh, at the bookstore. So, uh, without further ado, we can uh, we can get started. And uh, I, I don't know if you uh, maybe would like to say uh, a few words to, to get started. Maybe I'll, I'll start it off with like a, a question that maybe you can start on, and then feel free anybody yeah. after that. That's how we did it with the French uh, uh, session earlier. You know, <coughs> feel free to to ask questions, uh, make uh, comments. Mm -hmm. So I guess I, I'll start with this question that, you know, going back, we, we talked a little bit uh, about that yesterday or uh, last night, but a part of your, your speech was about, you know, uh, nowadays, you know, how in France one of the big, big questions that comes back is to, to prove your Frenchness mm. and what is it to be French? Mm. So uh, I guess I could start, well, what, what would you answer to that if you as a Marie Dariusek, uh, as a, what is it to be a French novelist today or what is it to be French? So that's two questions. Um, what is it to be French? Um, I, I know a lot of people who are French, and uh, for example, one of my best friends is, is she's born in uh, Morocco uh, from uh, French parents, um, and uh, she's born there because uh, her parents were teaching uh, mathematics in a, a high school in Morocco, and she came back to France when she was four. And um, and she's French, like I said yesterday. She's white from Catholic background, etc., etc. But when she had to have a passport to travel, uh, she had to um, give comment on ça a certificate a birth certificate to to prove, in fact, that she's French. So she gave her birth certificate in Morocco. And uh, they said, well, uh, but can you prove that your parents are French then? So, but, uh, so well, she, she really needed the passport. So she went back to her parents. Her father is dead and her mother is alive. Her mother was born in Strasbourg, but her father was born 
somewhere in the ex-colonies, I can't remember where. So he wasn't born in French e either. So she, 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 it, it was difficult to find the birth certificate, etc. But this, this woman, she, she, was a, uh, she was a friend from the Ecole Normale Supérieure, and, and it, was, it took her like four months to prove that she was French, which is crazy. So I have absolutely no idea what it means to be French, except, I don't know, uh, like uh, good cooking, or this sort of cliches, or I don't know, wearing perfumes, or whatever. But it, it, the new administration puts people in, um, in dire straits on this side, mm -hmm. 10 points. Uh, so, uh, in situations that are really absurd, administratively speaking, and very uh, uh, vexating, vexant, uh, uh, frustrating. Uh, frustrating, annoying. Well. Then, what is to be a French writer? Well, it is to write in French, I think. But it's a good question to me because my mother tongue is uh, Basque. So I could, I, I can't write in Basque. I, I speak a little bit of Basque. But some of my Basque uh, fellow writers, uh, so Basque country is a very small country. It's, it's a place, it's not a country, it's not an independent country, but it's a, let's say, a region divided between France and Spain on the Atlantic Ocean, uh, in the Bay of ba ba Gascogne? Uh, yeah, Gascogne yeah. Bay. And um, so the, 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 the common point of the Basque is their language. It's a very specific language. And, um, and, and they are supposed to be um, there uh, since at least the, the, the trace there in that region dates back from the, the prehistoric ages, whatever. But um, my mother tongue is, is Basque, and some of my fellow Basque writers uh, see me as a trader, in a way. Yeah, a traitor. Uh, yeah, a traitor. Uh, because I write in French, which is in a way the language of the, it's not about colonization, but about the op oppressor, in a way. Because the Basque have a very painful and violent history, uh, especially on the Spanish side, um, when they were confronted to F Franco, uh, the, the, the Spanish dictator who tortured them, who put them in jail, who, and uh, of course, who bombed, uh, um, who gave sort of permission to the Nazis to bomb a small village called Guernica, who was completely erased, and who um, was, became famous thanks to Picasso, who did this huge painting called Guernica, um, of, of this massacre, of this bombing. Anyway, so the Basque do have an identity, and I come from there, and, uh, and I, I agree in some way. I, I am a traitor, but my aim is not to save Basque Country. My aim is to be read, être lu. <laughs> I want to be a writer and I want to be read uh, in French and, if possible, abroad. So starting writing in Basque, is, it, it's an issue, it's a political issue, but I don't want to, to I can't and I, I wouldn't want to write in Basque because it would put me in a corner, in a geographical corner, but also in a, in a linguistic corner. There are very good Basque writers. One of them, I think, will have the Nobel Prize one day. He's called Bernardo Achaga. Achaga, A-T-X-A-J-A. -A -A. And he writes in Basque and he translates his books in, himself in Spanish and then they get a wider audience. But um, in a way, he does. Uh, it's not betrayal, but you know, he, he translates them. He, he is aware that he needs a wider audience than just the two million Basque people in the pla on the planet. So uh, I don't know exactly what it means to be French. I know I'm from a Basque background, and um, perhaps I know better what it is to be Basque because we have the story of oppression. When you are oppressed, you 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 know who is your enemy. You know where to fight. When you are French. It's much more complex. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's interesting what you are saying about the, the choice of the language mm. to write because it's very similar to uh, some of the, uh, the Maghrebi or African writers. You know, sure. like uh, people like Ben Jeloun, for instance, mm. he said that you know it's a choice that they are aware. And in terms of talking about you know a right to be read as opposed to a uh, right to defend, uh, you know something. Mm. But this idea of how um, you know, uh, in, the, in the case of Benjelou, he was explaining that if he, write, if he were to write in Arabic, then his audience would be much smaller. And so that if he writes in French, 
he knows that he's going to reach a much uh, much bigger uh, much well, the bigger Arabic audience. audience is big but but for in terms of people who can read yeah, and who can yeah. afford to buy the, the yeah. book mm -hmm. and so for him it's like there is this kind of dilemma and and I mean I'm using him as an example but you know as you know he's not the only one to, to say things like that but which is like this dilemma between you know if we really want those ideas those things we are denouncing to be read by a wider audience, we have to choose that language of the, as you said, that it was used to be the language of the oppressor. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Yeah, that's true. Are there questions about it? Okay, comments, questions, uh, yeah. Yusuf. Yeah, I, you know, in Pig Tales, mm -hmm. you know, um, you, the whole story of transformation, mm -hmm. I think you seem to suggest issues of oppression with what some of your reviewers have called a very dystopian look of the, of the universe and mm -hmm. so And so, I mean, whether you like it or not, uh, you are responding to very oppressive conditions around you. Mm -hmm. Do you accept that premise? Um, I, are you, for me, this book is about the oppression of the woman, okay. basically. Um, and I think it was also a, um, a political book, not only for women, but about a certain state of France at that time in the 90s, um, where the, uh, the, the Front National, the fascist party from the extreme right, were, was rising in the pools, no, the, 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 the polls, polls. The polls, pas les pools, les pools. The pools, not the pools. So at that time, it was very, in a way, autobiographical, this book, because uh, it was a metaphor of, of what I was uh, living as a young woman. I was uh, 25 in France. Um, I was economically uh, oppressed. I was a student. I had no money. I, uh, life was hard. And, um, and I, was, I was feeling very, very angry, and I didn't know exactly why. It was very, I was in a big state of confusion, I think, and depression, too. So I, I wrote this book. Like, comment j'ai dit en français tout à l'heure? Un état de, un état de grâce. Oui, non, non. State of grace. Oui, or even in a state of grace. Et aussi dans un état second, de colère. Comment dire? État second, that's the order to. C'est pas exactement un état de grâce. Almost unconsciously. Oui, oui, oui. Anyway, do I answer your question or what? Yeah. I'm, not, I'm trying to drag you into yeah. Where where are you <laughs> trying to drag me <laughs> into um, the point that you you're making a very powerful political statement. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, and and it's so it's, it's an important statement on the universe from your point of view in France that it speaks to the oppression of women generally, not only French women. Oh, but, mm. yeah, but there is a very global view about it. Oppression of women that can be filtered through. Well, I, 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 if you think so, I'm very happy about it because I, I hope this book is not only French. I hope so, and, and it had an audience in other countries. So I, and I know it found an echo in um, not only uh, among women but also among men. So I, I, I don't know how, I don't know what happened in my mind or how. I was when I wrote this book. I was I was like porous to the world. I was. Um, um, I had the feeling to be a voice, not me, but a voice. Uh, uh, something had to be said, and I, and I said it. Uh, and, and, it uh, and it it was sometimes I was a bit in a sort of trance when I wrote it. Trance, right? That's in a trance, quite trance. Uh, right. 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 Um, right. <laughs> um, and yeah, I hope I hope every day, still today, 15 years, 16 years after that, every day I receive comments about this book uh, from a bit everywhere and it's it's a one of it's a great pleasure and, and it's also something that completely over uh, passed over my head you know what I mean I, 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 this book doesn't belong to me anymore it's uh, you know I just yeah. Yeah. you you did you did I'm sorry yeah. go, go ahead then I, I'll follow up on that go ahead yeah well I, I want to talk about one of the most arresting images in the world mm -hmm. in uh, what um, <coughs> The employer mm -hmm. holding a, a job contract yeah. on one hand, yeah. and then on the, the other hand, on the woman's breast. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, uh, how do you conceive of moments like this in a story? 
All I know is that I wrote the book um, the, in the middle of the 90s, as, a, as you said, a dystopian uh, world, something that was not the world, but a sort of world that should not happen. As, uh, it was, I wrote it almost as an exorcism, that's something, it must not happen. Uh, and now when I look at the world, a lot of things that are in the book are, are actually happening. And the oppression of uh, women, and the, uh, for example, in the, in the book, the woman gets a job um, after, well, she, uh, 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 to speak very literally, she's a prostitute. She, do, she doesn't even realize she's a prostitute. She's so alienated that she doesn't have the intellectual tools to think uh, of her situation. And she gets a job that is paid uh, a third of the minimum wages, French wages, and who implies a lot of hours dispatches dispatched anywhere on the week. And now it's the day-to-day -day life to many women. And that, at, at that time in the 90s, you didn't have jobs who were, you know, you see what I mean, my, my English is a bit, but, but uh, where you have to work from 4 to 8 in the morning, then to 2 to 4 in the afternoon, then to 10 to midnight for nothing. And now people are in, in such despaired situation, and women especially, that they accept this sort of job, especially cleaning ladies who do, you know, they clean offices, or, or, or people who work in restaurants, or things like that. And so it happens. And, um, well, anyway, and a lot of things that are in that book are happening today. Well, to, to kind of follow up on, on Yusuf's question and what you were saying, you, um, I think it was last year we, we, we talked about this over our over email that you had said how, and I think you had been working with a playwright even about this, how uh, it's fascinating that uh, the book was written in 1996, mm. but at how in 2010 in the Friends of Sarkozy there are so oh, many, yeah. so many. Right. It's almost yeah. like the the same mm. story yeah. is being repeated. Can but you say a little bit yeah. about that? Well, there was a play adapted recently in France um, about this book, and um, and so I I wrote I rewrote some not some parts of it, but I I um, the 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 ah uh, the director yes the director sent me. An adaptation, it was in Spanish, the adaptation, because the director is from Argentina. And I read it and I thought, oh, there are some parts that I should. So I started rewriting it and I, I thought, how did it go in the book itself? So I took the book and I said, in fact, I don't really have to rewrite it. It's, and I realized that the main character is called Edgar. He's a, the president of the Republic, Edgar. And this Edgar is with top models, goes on yachts, um, he's uh, wearing hmm. big watches. He, he's only doing parties, and, and it's what we call bling bling. The bling <laughs> bling is the adjective for Sarkozy. The, you know, very sure, flashy. very flashy. And, and, and 15 years ago, I said, Edgar is Sarkozy. It's exactly the same. Okay. And it's a bit scary because. Um, Just imagine if it had been sports cards. <laughs> <laughs> well, I agree. But the opinions are not exactly the same. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. No, it's true. Absolutely. No, it the orgies. In 1996, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think Monsieur Rappel said, "La France est déprimée." Right. Uh, and <coughs> you see how how bad things were, how bad it felt. Fifteen years later, now it's so much just it's Yeah, yeah. And the, yeah, the, the constant sorry. orgy and the constant showing off. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, but I don't know. I was uh, I was <coughs> 25, and I didn't know anything about anything. And I think, I, yeah, the world. Uh, I was like a sponge, you know. I was uh, receiving the world very naively. It's a very naive book too. It's, a, it's very, it's, it's a book from a young woman, I think. Sometimes I, when I had to read it again for that play, I, I thought, oh my God, did I write this? And, and, and well, yes, I did. So it's very naive, but it's also very um, direct. Very, it has, it has an energy for sure. Did, did anything ever happen with uh, as somebody interested in film? I, I had read at some point that uh, Jean-Luc Godard yeah, he, had, he had bought the rights uh, yeah. of the to adapt as a film. Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> Peak tells. Did anything happen with? I mean, yeah, well, obviously story. not. But yeah, if you could yeah. address that a little bit. But you also have to imagine that I was a student, like most of you, and uh, I was so I was uh, as I told you, young and poor and uh, a bit lost. And all of a sudden, my life completely changed, completely. I had a lot of money, and I met a lot of people. And all this in the first month after the publishing of the book. And one day, I come back to my student room, you know, 
and I, I had it's middle of the 90s, so I, I had this big answering machine, you know, with the, and there was a beep. Uh, before that, I never had any beep. Before that, <laughs> and now there was like 15, you know, beeps. Wow! And so I press the button, and I hear this unmistakable voice of Jean-Luc Godard, who's got this very thick Switzerland accent, and it went like. Bonjour, c'est Jean-Luc Godard. <laughs> I thought, it's a joke, it's a joke. And Jean-Luc Godard was, oh my God, you know, I, I, I loved him. And, and, and he said, j'ai parlé à votre éditeur. And I, I spoke to your publisher and I went to buy the rights. And I, I, I was, and I, I, it was his voice, so I, I had to believe it. And uh, we started working together on a, a script. But I was too young and I was too impressed. I was very shy. Now I, w I would know how to handle Jean-Luc Godard, but at that time I didn't know at all how to handle Jean-Luc Godard. And he was very French and very, uh, very Strauss-Canian. So I, he wanted to sleep with me, basically. And I, 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 I didn't know what to do with that. <laughs> and uh, and um, so I, I kept him at distance, but it was very weird. I couldn't handle that. I was just a student. He was too much for me. So I, there's. One, I, 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 he was also a great guy, but there was um, one very important moment for me is that he understood that I didn't know anything to cinema. I was, I was going a lot to the Cinémathèque, the French Cinémathèque, as a lot of students, but I was, there were many, many movies because I was so young that I hadn't seen, and I hadn't seen all of his movies. And so he decided to teach me, in a way, his movies. And so I was in his Parisian apartment um, it was crazy. Uh, in, the, in the 16th arrondissement, everything was gorgeous and big. And, and um, he would um, show me ces histoires du cinéma. It's, it's six movies called History of Cinema. It's an absolute masterpiece where Jean-Luc Godard makes his own history of cinema. It's not he. It's uh, basically on DVD or on TV. I don't know if there were so many screws. Uh, uh, you know, ça avait tellement été montré au cinéma. Mais, um, so I was in his um, home cinema, and at that time it was very uncommon in a home cinema. And I watched these movies, and they were amazing. And there was Jean-Luc Godard pacing, you know, in the corridor and smoking his big cigar, and just like in a movie, you know, everything was. And I was, I was, it was too much for me all this. And um, so perhaps because of that, perhaps because I couldn't work on this script. Perhaps because our relationship were too complex, suddenly he disappeared. Really, uh, I had no news, nothing. And six months later, um, in uh, the middle of uh, uh, '97, I had a phone call from him, and he said, "Okay, I'm not doing the movie anymore. I'm, I'm doing another one called Eloge de l'Amour." And I said, "But where have you been?" Where are <laughs> and and, uh, and he said, "J'ai joué au tennis." I've been playing tennis. <laughs> <laughs> that was his explanation. <laughs> and months later again, I read an interview by, of him in uh, the magazine Lire. And, and uh, he, he was very elegant in the interview because he said, so, so people said, so you're not going to do the, the, the Darius Egg movie anymore. And he said, no, because it's, it's, uh, it's too, c'est un trop bon livre. The book is too good. The book is too good and you can't adapt such a good book. You need to adapt books that need something to be added to them. Like Le Mépris, is, uh, the, the, the Moravia, c'était l'ennemi. So I thought it was very, a very elegant way out. And I got the money anyway, so. <laughs> but it was, I always re regretted a bit, of course. He had very good ideas. He wanted to put pieces of cartoons in it. He wanted to, uh, he wanted to play also with the, the character of Alice in Wonderland. And it was a very good intuition. So, well, and I had other propositions uh, after that, but after Jean-Luc Godard, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so I, I, Almodovar would be great, or uh, David Lynch, or Cronenberg, but if not, then... So how, <laughs> how, does that, how, does, uh, how does that work in that case, that he still owns the rights then, right? No, so, no, okay. no, no, the, 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 the writers, are, the authors are very well protected in France, les droits d'auteur. <coughs> so he owned the rights only for two years. Okay. So now they are free again, and uh, there are regularly propositions, but I'm still waiting. Um, 
For theater, it's not the same. There were many, many stage adaptations. I see. It's not the same system. And, uh, I, uh, uh, for theater, I almost always accept. <coughs> Questions? questions? <coughs> oh, and he also wanted me to play in it. Oh. <laughs> to play the, the, the part of the pig. So I said, no, no. <laughs> 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 uh, it was a crazy story. <laughs> well, perhaps one thing that, uh, since we have several students, I think, here, or other people at least who are not in, uh, in French, but who are interested in writing, I think they are creative writing mm -hmm. students, uh, perhaps you could talk a little bit about, um, you, you just touched on that just now by saying that, how uh, uh, writers are protected in France, and mm -hmm. so maybe to talk a little bit about the, the industry in France and the publishing industry and what it is to be a writer, how do you approach uh, as a young writer starting and mm -hmm. all of that? Okay, um, there's a very important law in France, it's the prix unique du livre. Um, you can't um, do, s uh, tu peux pas solder les livres. You, can't you, uh, you cannot uh, offer rebates on books? Oui. Um, it, the, the price of the books are blocked, uh, so you, you can't, um, if a book is 20 euros, it is 20 euros. You, you cannot, you know, uh, buy two and get one free. It's, uh, and it's very well protective, uh, it's, it's very protective for the writers, and also it's same for the booksellers. So there are a lot of, still, in, even if there is the Amazon um, internet, um, there are still booksellers a bit everywhere in France, because um, they can't fight, they can't, they can't compete, mm -hmm. Amazon or the big um, uh, book chains. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a law. Um, what else? Um, we don't have agents uh, in France. It's very, um, there are some very, Welbeck, Michel Welbeck as an agent because he's really one of the most successful writers uh, abroad. Uh, but. And the, um, I have another friend, Philippe Gian, who has an agent, but I don't. I don't need, I don't feel the need of an agent. There is this sort of relationship, perhaps it's typically French, uh, of trust between the writer and the publisher. Um, I, when I was, when I chose that publisher, so in the French uh, course I explained that when I sent pictures, I sent it to six publishers and I had four positive answers. Three big companies and Paywell, who was a small company, but who I liked very much because they were ambitious, literally, they, they, they published poetry, etc. And when I got into the house, into the publishing company, Paywell, it was all, there was only one telephone, I remember, <laughs> and there was this old carpet full of uh, holes of cigarettes, you know, it was really shabby, really, but they were happy and enthusiastic and young and, and, uh, and we became friends in fact. And so they told me we don't have much money, we can't do advertising like most of the publishers in France. We can't advertise for your book and you will have a basic contract and the basic contract is 10%. 10% of the price of the book goes to me. So on a novel that costs 20 euros, I have 2 euros basically. And, uh, and that was okay with me and they took care of everything. And they, I, I thought they did a great job with Pigtail. So why leave? And I had other propositions from bigger companies, but I, I know that, for example, at Grasset, where they offered me a lot of money, or Albert Michel, they would, at some point, they, they would have asked me to do Pigtails 2, Pigtails 3, etc. <laughs> and I, with Paywell, I do exactly what I want. I do it when I want it. Uh, they, I, I feel okay. I know I could have more money elsewhere, but I'm okay, and and uh, and, and we are friends basically. So now I have 14 percent of the wow, but it's the maximum because um, th there is also a system of low. Uh, so you can't have more, except if you get out of this sort of c'est un sort de système de sécurité sociale pour les écrivains. Quoi. Ouais. If you get out of the social security system for writers, and if you get an agent, you go in the Anglo-Saxon system, and that's more like a jungle. And I don't want that, so I, I'm, I'm okay with people. And so when when the when you write a book and you are done, and with the publisher, you know you agree that's going to be published. Can you take us to the step? Are there is there like some step that you you know you follow like in France or that or is there like a marketing plan that is being oh. done? Do you have, do you have to go okay. like to see the media and like how, the, how does that work? But first, I remind you that France is a small country, so we are 16 million people, and the francophone market is perhaps 
100, uh, 100 million, 100 million people. So it's not a big market. So it's not the the, co the economical interests are not. It's cool. It's 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 cool. So um, wh when one starts writing in France, one knows that he or she is got not going to be extremely rich. That's not the point. You know, we are not fighting for that. We, we are happy to be published. Most of the writers in France have another job. And I'm really happy to be able to live only with my writing, but we are very, very few people like, like me. So PEL, still a small company, but, but much more successful than before. Um, what is the plan media? Media plan? The, the yeah, the marketing plan. plan. Of PEL, okay, I'm going to tell you what it is. We go to a restaurant, La Closerie de Lila or, or whatever, we drink, we eat, we drink a lot, and it's two in the morning and the restaurant is going to close and oh my god, yeah, we should talk about that. So <laughs> what, what are we going to do? Well, we should, you know what, you know what, we should send the book to Le Monde and Libération, which is, well, it's, it's so evident, it's basic <laughs> newspapers, the more important newspapers in France. Yeah, we should do that. And you know what? We should also send it to the Figaro, even if they're <laughs> bastards. <laughs> so that's that's the plan. You see, so so it's just it's very. I can't I can't explain. It's not American at all. I think, <laughs> but it's uh, it's just the it's a very small industry. It's um, and then it, so you don't generate much money, but you generate a lot of talk. You, you launch a book and you have all these articles everywhere in the press. If I don't have them, I'm very disappointed. So you, ha you have all this talking, this polemics, these attacks, these critics, and I like it a lot. I, I like it, but it's not. It's not. A, it's, it's almost not an economy. It's a very small market. You, you'd better sell vegetables or whatever mm -hmm. than, than books in France. But well, but it, it, we have this phenomenon in September called la rentrée littéraire, where this country is able to to dispute to, to about some books and, and people are against or for it and it's 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 fun. That's it's violent, but it's just fun. to explain to some of you maybe who are not familiar with the, the, the French publishing industry, but la rentrée littéraire is a, is a kind of a, la rentrée is the term you use for back to school. Uh, and so la rentrée littéraire is uh, every year in September. Uh, late August, one. September, that's when most of the most of the books are being published. Uh, or at least most of the novels. And, uh, and one of the reasons, yeah, go ahead, sorry. No, 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 please do. Yeah, so one of, one of the reasons for that is uh, because the, the most prestigious literary prizes are being awarded uh, every year around uh, November, yeah. November. So if you want to be, it's kind of like, you know, with film here, if they want to be in the running for the Oscars, they're going to release them around like Christmas time, you know. <laughs> and so you have this, and, but what happens, uh, uh, Marie Dariusek had a, a good point. I mean, this is really true how, you know, you have this kind of disproportion between like that France is such a, a small country with, you know, only a, a certain number of uh, potential readers. Mm -hmm. But then every rentrée littéraire, you have like what, about 600 novels? 700. Or yeah, 700 yeah. new novels yeah. published, yeah. Uh, you know, at the same time, mm -hmm. you know, at, at that time of the year. Including uh, translations from abroad, because we uh -huh. translate a lot of books. Uh -huh. But it's not for money. And, and the analogy with American, with the, with the Oscars of American filmmaking, is good up to a point. What um, I have a class now with uh, with, with uh, a lot of French cinema, and the students keep talking about the difference between American films and French films, and they, they can't account for the, the you know they have they're open ended at the, at the at the ending because you don't know what's going to happen and, and uh, what, what's up with that. Why don't they tell us? Um, there's um, they don't have happy endings. <laughs> Why do they do that? Why are French movies so, and, and they're so intellectual? What's up? And last week, no, a couple of weeks ago, an issue of Time magazine talked about the uh, new release of two two films, the. Um, Les Intouchables, no? The the was no the one with no two American films. Um, uh, Something games for the uh, the uh, Hunger games. Games, games and bully, mm -hmm. and in this <coughs> two-page article, the the author is it's a, it's a film critic, a fairly well-known American film critic, Richard Corliss, put his finger on it. He says, if he put he put his finger on not only the problem with American cinema but the difference between American and French, and this goes back to your comparison with the book market in the U.S. You know, it's not that they release it right before Christmas because everybody's going to go. 
the big thing to do with uh, the production of an American movie is to aim it at a PG-13 audience. Right. So you're not talking about adults as your target audience. You're talking about PG-13 because anything higher, more adult, won't sell as much. Anything lower, uh, general, you know, mm -hmm. ch younger children won't sell as much either. either. So that, and he gave all of these examples of movies that were redone, re-edited, re re-scripted, so that they would get this coveted PG-13 yeah. classification because an American film, what it aims at is to make as much money as possible. So I said to my students, do you think that's what French films are aiming at, to make as much money as possible? They started to say, well, maybe not. Maybe uh, the difference is that, and then we had this plan words with art et argent. That's true. And God and Godard. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes. Yeah, but, well, uh, for, 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 it's for, 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 for um, books, you know, it's the same thing. It's not intended to become uh, a multi billion dollar. You know, marketing art. No, but it's very simple. A book in France is uh, rentable. Um, uh, it generates revenues. No, but not even. Uh, it to to launch a Breaks book. Breaks even. Where mm. to to launch a book, it costs, and I know it by by publisher, one thousand five hundred euros. It's nothing. Mm. So it's the cost of the paper, the ink. Um, uh, the, the the distribution is 1,500 euros. It's nothing. So as soon as you um, sell um, 200 copies, you're you're good. You, all your you, you, all yeah, your, your expenses, your expenses right, are, covered. are covered. 200 copies. It's nothing. So you can publish poetry if you really want it. You can. You will not make money, but you can. <laughs> so my publisher publishes poetry and he sells. 200, 250, but he does. And sometimes he has a bestseller, so the house can go on and he can pay the wages to yeah. it. So, and, and so if you really want it, you, and there are many little companies, publishing companies in France who do theater, who do poetry, who do essays. It's hard, you, you don't make money, but you can do it. It's a, it's a philosophy. So. Uh, praise? Yeah, um, I have a, a few students in my research methods and they want to know if you engage in any form of research as a research. Christian writer. Uh, research you mean uh, as a like creative writing or uh, research? As a creative writer, do you engage in, in some kind of research? As academic writers, we do research. So they want to know if you as a different kind of writer also engage in any form of research. Um, that depends what you call research. My, um, for example, at the moment, I do for myself a lot of research for my next novel. Is, is that what you mean? Yeah. I, I, I do. Uh, um, I, I'm, 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 for example, I'm going to travel for that novel. I want to go to Gabon. I want to see the forest, uh, the equatorial forest. And I've read a lot, uh, a lot of African uh, writers and a lot of history of Africa and of, of the colonization and uh, a lot of. Um, books about art, especially funk art, which I didn't know at all. So I, I, I do this sort of thing. I also read a lot on the internet. Um, for example, the, a very good uh, Fran French-speaking uh, site, site. site called uh, the Luango Kingdom, uh, full of, I don't know, informations and images. So I do this sort of research. And I talked with Jean Echnaud. You know, Jean Echnaud is a French writer, um, quite famous in France. And um, one of his first novels, 25 or 30 years ago, was in Malaysia, L'Equipe Malaise, in Malaysia. And he told me that at that time, he had to go to the tourism uh, center in Paris of Malaysia to get some lousy, you know, little books and, and there was no internet and you couldn't do anything and I, I and so I, I do a lot of research on the internet but also I can without internet for example I spent a lot of time I think some of you are from Nigeria I, there are some things that you can get in bookshops and libraries but for example I wanted to hear the difference between Yoruba language, Igbo language and the Hausa language so I, I went on YouTube
YouTube and I tapped, you know, Ibo, Hausa, Yoruba, and I heard, I just heard the, the difference. Because there are many movies, etc., and um, all, all these movies in Nollywood, etc. And I was wondering, wow, this is 2012. How could I have done that even 12 years ago? How could I have listened to an Igbo speaking per person in Paris? Where would I have found him or her? So that's great. You know, that's the kind of research I do. But sometimes I wonder if it's research because I'm home, you know, just with my iPad. Yeah. Wow, it's great. So yeah. it's very la lazy research. Yeah, I do. You don't go to the Bibliothèque Nationale and... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, Yusuf. Yeah, um, some writers talk about literary fathers and mothers or influences yes. and so on. Do you have any? Oh, I do, yeah, a lot. Um, I have some French writers, like, uh, for example, well, they are the classic ones, Stendhal uh, or Flaubert, of course. Who, I mean, is there a French writer today who hasn't read them? I don't know. Uh, because we <coughs> have them at school, so Balzac also, it's less. Uh, it's good we are recording this because we'll play it to all the students again. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but also Marguerite Duras, a lot in France. Um, um, and this guy I was speaking about in the French lesson, um, in French class, um, Hervé Guibert, uh, who, who died in uh, 92 at the age of 36. And was a bit, uh, what a big influence on me. I don't exactly know why, but I loved his language. I loved, uh, I don't know, the, and he himself was very much influenced by Thomas Bernhardt. So there was a sort of, um, uh, yeah, family of writers. Uh, and sometimes they are secret families because uh, I, I, I'm not sure it's obvious that I'm influenced by Hervé Guibert, who was influenced by Thomas Bernhardt. But I know it's true in, inside. So yes, I do have fathers and mothers, um, but um, um, sometimes they are. So for example, I, uh, one of my books you were talking about. Oh, he's gone. He was talking about research. But one of my books uh, takes place in Antarctica. I've never been to Antarctica. It's called White, even in English it's translated. And I, I read uh, a lot of stories of the explorers, like uh, Shackleton or um, or Amundsen or, or Scott. Or so they are not literary influences, but of course they gave me so much. So White anyway. White was not translated into English. Was yes. it? Oh, he was in England. Oh yes, yes that's right. Okay, yeah. because even in the French edition, it has the, the English title. And right. I, yeah. This <laughs> the, that's one I, I like very much. It takes place in the South Pole. Yeah. Yeah. Now, what kind of writing was that? What kind of piece? It's called White. It's a novel taking place in Antarctica. And oh, okay. It's a novel. It is a novel. Pure fiction. I've never been uh -huh. there, but uh, I, I. So you're saying not literary because. Well, right. because I, you know, Amundsen, Scott, Shackleton are explorers, not yeah. literary, you know, writers. And they wrote, writer. but they wrote. The, they wrote the novel. No, but no, they no, no. wrote their tale. Uh, uh, Scott had his diary. Yeah. Shackleton had. A, this was also a diary, and I read them like in their way. They are masterpieces. Yeah. But it's not literature. It's something else. But it gave me a lot. Uh, this this books. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, uh, was there any like certain experience in your life that inspired you to start writing? Sure, of course. Yeah, yeah. There are not only books. There are, there's life, of course. But uh, I think a bit everything. Um, my last novel, Clev, uh, is very much inspired by my teenage diary. Uh, but it's the only one who is really inspired by direct experience. Um, I wrote one autobiographical <coughs> book, completely autobiographical, but it's not translated in English, The Baby. Mm -hmm. Well, let's forget it. Uh, and I the Baby. The Baby. Um, I think all of my books are inspired by bits of my life. Uh, but of course, I mean, of course. Uh, I can't even prevent it. But it's rewritten by fiction. It's uh, I, I do it my way. I don't know. It's. Uh, and sometimes for bad reasons. Sometimes I just only want to protect some people, not to expose them too much. And that's a bad reason. But I think all the writers have to deal with that. And maybe I loved Hervé Guibert so much, that this guy who died so young in the 90s, because he dared everything. He didn't care about exposing his parents, his boyfriends and girlfriends, and, uh, and his life. And it was like raw life, and I loved it. But I'm not this sort of writer. I, I always feel like, like, Sometimes I, I shouldn't expose 
some people too much. But yeah. anyway. It's like writing about life, but life comes in the way too. Anyway, body. life comes in the way all the time. Uh, and sometimes you even write a book and then it happens to you. What you've written in the book happens to you in, in real life. But it's not a coincidence. It's because you provoke what happens to you in life. And you, there is that novel in your mind. And in fact, it's going to happen to you because you provoke things, if you see what I mean. And I, and I even know that sometimes I met this sort of guy because I wanted to write this sort of novel and this sort of love story. So writers are crazy people, you know. It's <laughs> <laughs> but you can't ex escape that, in a way. So did anything, big tales manifest in your life later? Well, actually, if I wanted <laughs> to be provocative, big tale is really autobiographical, in a way. Because it's a, it's, it's a metaphor for uh, what happened, I mean, this book changed my life, and this book has completely transformed me. So it was both a, a tale of what I, I, what I had lived through my teenagehood, because every teenager is somebody who transforms himself or herself into something new. And sometimes you feel like an animal. So uh, it's, a, it's a true story in a way. But then this book has actually transformed me, my life and everything. So it was, it was a true story of, of metamorphosis in a way. It's a metaphor, of course, but in a way. So, um, you said previously you, uh, you wrote uh, tourism um, for six, six weeks, in oui. six weeks, mm -hmm. but you like singing about it for one year. And oh. how did you know you have to write? How, how's, oui. like, yeah. how That's it. did you have conscious? <coughs> like, no, I see your point. It, it, the problem is not to have ideas, because ideas, everybody has ideas all the time. It's not a problem. The problem is to know what idea is rich enough to lead to a book. Sometimes I have ideas for short stories, for example, and they are not uh, less good or, than for novels. It's just a short story. Um, this idea of a woman transforming into a, a sow, a pig, when I had it for the first time, among other ideas, I thought, that's ridiculous. Well, that's that's ridiculous and that's very embarrassing, that's very awkward. So, uh, but it came back and it came back all the time. So that's a good sign. When, when an idea comes back and comes back and comes back, you have to do something with it. And I didn't know it would lead to a book, but as soon as I started the actual writing of it, wow, it, it, um, it unfurled. Mm -hmm. right. But did you did you did you were looking for ideas to read no. to write a book? Or no, they come. Uh, it's a, it's sometimes it's a problem. I I, I live too <laughs> much in my imagination. No, really, I, uh, my my life is completely um, intricated with my imagination. Uh, and luckily, I became a writer because mm -hmm. I, I don't know what I would have done with that. <laughs> uh, no, it's, it's on the verge of. Uh, craziness mm. sometimes, or of depression. De depression is sometimes very close. Because life is unsatisfying. <laughs> so imagination is so much more, you know, wow. So luckily enough for me, I could do something with it. I could even have a strange job with it, mm -hmm. and writing. So, uh, it, it, yeah. Do, do you, oh, sorry. Um, so I, I was just collecting a few mm. things that you mentioned about uh, your first book, Prisma. Uh, you mentioned that once it was published, it was no longer yours, it was out there. Mm. But you also said that uh, writing the book, uh, you felt like a sponge and you were mm -hmm. absorbing what the world had and you reflected your experiences in it. So trying to put this together as far as uh, interpretations of your text, and I'm talking specifically about Scarlet the Articles, for instance. Uh, do you have any expectations in terms of what you'd like to see? Mm -hmm. Is there anything that you'd like to see? Mm -hmm. And are there any conflicts between mm -hmm. what you had in mind when you're writing it and then what happened once it was out there? Mm -hmm. um, uh, I'll try to put it in English. Um, I, I accept all sorts of interpretations and I'm always happy to see that something has been written about my books because it means they are alive. And as I, as I said in the previous class, I, I, I need the, the reading of the academics. I, 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 it's uh, because I have a story with university. I, I, I'm, ha I'm always happy to have scholars write about me. Sometimes it's strange, but the only thing I don't accept is the interpretation that goes exactly in the opposite of the book, uh, qui dit exactement l'inverse du livre. And typically, um, the interpretation that was 
quite common at some, time, at some point to say that Pictures is a misogynistic book. This is mm. ridiculous okay. because it's exactly the contrary. Mm -hmm. It's just a, it's a, a mistake. It's not an interpretation. It's a mistake. Mm -hmm. But but that's all the other things: psychoanalysis, politics, uh, whatever. Yeah. This, uh, is a, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. this is a truism. I mean, we're we're all used to 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 the idea that. Everybody has a different reading mm. of, say, a novel or or a, or or a film. What surprises me, at, you know, uh, still after many many years doing this, is not that I find myself in discussions with students saying, uh, you know, are, are, are we talking about the same work? Yeah. Mm. But but how how huge the differences can be, and not just on a scale, but in in, in so many different directions. And to get in a class the students to see how different, they, they all sort of expect that everybody else is seeing the film the, the same way they are, or, or within a certain range. And they're, they're astonished when I, 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 I purposely take really divergent readings and say, both, you know, both of you are in this class. Were you surprised by how really, Divergent they, they can be? Yeah. Um, there are so many, many, many things that are written about what I write. Um, I don't control them. I, yeah. I don't read all of them. Most of the time, I don't read them, actually. Except the things coming from academics. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, because I have stupid respect you know, for, <laughs> for things written by academics. But uh, things written by in, in, the, in the newspapers, uh, my, my publishers in the different countries, they collect them and they send me um, la totalité. And I, 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 I live through them. And uh, if it's too bad, I don't read. But sometimes if it's too good, it's also a bit stupid. So I, I live through them. Well, but the, the really diff diverse um, things. Well, when I said, when I, the, the, uh, there's another question underneath that mm -hmm. question. It's about identification. We talk about mm -hmm. identifying with a, mm -hmm. with, a, with a work. Well, if you're going to identify with it, and everybody is so different, of course you're going to get people, you know, reading themselves into the book, into the story, and, and you know, so it's, it shouldn't be a surprise when when I say, are we are we reading? Are we talking about the same work? Because there was there was one film uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, where the the range of uh, reactions were, were, were so different, I could I said at one point it had it had to do with a scene in Ressources uh, Humaines where uh, the this is the main one of the main scenes where at the end uh, the son uh, who's gone back to his factory and Normandy has this explosion and, and and in front of all of the workers on the floor of the of the factory talks to his father about uh, la honte, la honte de sa classe, and he's, and he's yelling at him, he's, he's and, and my students are, are shocked. Someone says, I would never talk to my father that way. Somebody else says, well, of course I do. <laughs> and, 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 and it got to the point where I said, okay, y you tell me what you saw in that scene, and I'll tell you, you know, your relation with your father. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Also, I think you deal with young people, yeah. and uh, I, I don't do so much. And uh, when you get adults, I think, in fact, I would say I'm a bit uh, provocative, but I don't think people are so different, in fact, when they get older. And I think when you go back to Homer, <coughs> when you go back to the Iliad or the Odyssey, you have everything about humanity in it, to almost 2,000 years ago. Yeah. So, uh, how is love, how is war, uh, how is it to be hungry, how is it to be angry? Uh, I, I think, in a way, we are all the same. So I'm a bit provocative, but uh, you're dealing with very young people. So um, I remember uh, for my third novel, uh, Le Mal de Mer, it's translated. It's called Breathing, uh, Breathing uh, Underwater. Breathing uh, Underwater, or um, Undercurrent. It depends on the translation. And it's basically the story of a, it's not exactly a story, but uh, if there's a story, it's a story of a mother who abandons uh, her daughter. And I remember uh, facing these uh, high school kids, and um, one of them lifted her hand and she said, she was very angry, and she said, a mother would never do that. And, and I was so surprised, and I, and, I, and I thought, oh, she's 15. 
and uh, because it's all in the newspapers, mothers always do that in a way. <laughs> you see what I mean? So uh, because they don't know much about life. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Uh, Bio, I think you had a comment question. Okay, I want to take you back to your earlier discussion of how your numbers were received by people in uh, Basque, Basque? Basque country. Okay. Basque country. And in which they, they uh, saw you uh, fraternizing with the oppressor yeah. by writing in their language. Yeah. Now that uh, the setting for your new work is uh, Africa, yeah. uh, do you expect such a reaction? Because now they will not only really say you are uh, using the language of the oppressor, but of the colonizer. Yeah. And uh, how well, are you preparing for this? I'm aware. I'm aware of the issue, um, and I'm aware that I'm treading on the um, foreign ground. On the uh, and um, but I have my reasons to go there, and uh, um, I I I I'm 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 a very controversial writer. But perhaps you're not aware of that. Each time I, I, I publish a book, there is a big, almost every time, quite a big polemic, at least in France. And for the moment, I have had a lot, a lot of controversies about sex, about death, and how, as my husband puts it, and now you're going to talk about race, <laughs> as if you didn't have enough problems. <laughs> so I, I'm aware I'm going to... Um, uh, it's, it will be, it's very simple. It's a love story between a black man born in Africa and a white woman. It's very simple. But I, I'm aware that, that it's going to be very touchy. But I'm, I'm confident. Yeah. And we'll see. <laughs> that would have to run out of jungle fever. Yeah. 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 Yes, <laughs> that's right, that's right. Yeah. Maybe you could, to follow up on that, you could say a little bit about, because you had mentioned how in recent uh, months or generally a couple of years, you have been really getting into uh, African authors. Mm -hmm. Maybe you maybe could talk a little bit about that or some of them that, that well, um, really interest the, the, you. Well, the, the pitch, you say that? The mm -hmm. pitch? Yeah. Yeah, in French, we say that, the pitch. The pitch is a, I think, because for the moment it's all in my mind, I haven't re started yet. The pitch is um, an African movie maker. Um, I think perhaps, I don't know yet from which country, but it's he, he, uh, perhaps from Cameroon, uh, because I, I would like him to speak French, but also English for many novelistic reasons. Uh, he's a movie maker and he wants to shoot Heart of Darkness, but from the African point of view. And I know nothing about him. I have no African point of view. But the point is, he's going to hire a white actress to play the lady who stays, you know, behind, and uh, and also I'm completely I, I I've been nourished a lot by Apocalypse Now, and I've always wondered why didn't he shoot it in Congo for it, for many reasons, but it it would have been interesting in Congo. Anyway, so that's the pitch, and it's seen, of course, from the white woman's point of view. It's written from the white woman's point of view. I wouldn't dare write it from the black man's point of view, I guy, but I I will write it from the white woman's point of view, the actress. And I, 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 I think I know what I'm going to do. But yeah, it's, it's, uh, perhaps I will get into trouble. But I'm a writer. I mean, I'm not, I'm not uh, neating home. I write. <laughs> when you write, you get, your hands get dirty. You get, in, you get in pride in society. You get, you get in trouble sometimes. But I accept it. But if you had been there yesterday, you would have heard that I had said <laughs> intelligent things about Africa. <laughs> What do you think, Yusuf? Yeah, you were I, there. No, I was there, yeah. <laughs> uh, I enjoyed it. <laughs> uh, so, does your work, does writing transform you? Mm. you know, do you grow from writing? Oh, of course, so, it transforms and how, me. How does that do that? Um, I, I actually, it's, uh, I, I can't talk about it, but I know it's, it's, uh, it's, it's getting private because um, I know exactly how writing transforms me, but it transforms in me in very deep, intimate things. Uh, it transforms my dreams a lot. I dream about the novel that I'm writing, and in a way, sometimes I have this feeling that the novel is dreaming me. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's really, and um, I, I know that I get involved, as I told you, I get involved in some friendships or loves or, or, or situations to be able to write them. 
So it's a, it's a way of living life that's almost the other way around than, than normal people. As very often I have the feeling that I leave things in order to write them. And not that I write things because I have lived them in a way. You know, first I, 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 I know what I want to write and I try to live it first in a way, which is never exactly possible. But So I can never exactly make out, you know, separate life and writing. I'm not an autobiographical writer. I write fiction, but in a way I want to live that fiction. So. Uh, in the French session, you say, um, I think you have two experiences to, tr to uh, write a book and you give it up because it was not working. Yeah, yeah. What about them? Okay. Uh, my, my second novel after Pictures uh, was called Iridium. Iridium is a white metal coming from the planets, from um, uh, the space. Um, it was called Iridium and it was a, a story of a secret agent involved in uh, Europe before the fall of the Berlin Wall. And I, I, the tone of the book, I liked it very much and I still like it. Th this book had a music of its own that I liked very much, but the plot got too intricate and I couldn't get out of it because I had not made a, a plan. Uh, so I, I just, I just forgot it. Perhaps one day I will try it again. But you forgot it, or you? I let it aside. Okay. Mm -hmm. But after a long time, uh, it was in a, in a, a cul de sac, in a bus. Comment on dit ça? Uh, a cul de sac. A cul de sac. Yeah. yeah. Cul de sac. <laughs> and uh, the first version of White, this uh, novel in South Pole, was also uh, shouldn't do that. Was also about a secret agent, <laughs> um, about. A colony of um, those tall penguins, the Manchon mm -hmm. who uh, suddenly died, and that was the first hint that perhaps a bacteriological weapon had been used in, in you know, down in the ice in a secret basis, military basis, blah blah blah. So I started the story. I was very excited, and and uh, and there were. <coughs> And the, the, the CIA was implied, and they were, and all of a sudden, it was September 11. And as many writers on this planet, my little book became completely irrelevant, you know? It, it, it was meaningless. And, and I thought, why write about secret agents? They were not even able to stop that, you know? And, and I, I don't know. It, uh, so I completely remade the plot. It still happened in South Pole, but it was completely different. But I had to um, recover from the shock, like everybody else. But as a writer, many many writers were, uh, uh, on témoigné, uh, testified, testified uh, yeah. this shock of, uh, of wondering why, why am I writing this? Yeah. Well, witness this shock, uh, uh, or they had the experience. Douglas of that, Kennedy, uh, no, not Douglas Kennedy, and another more serious author. What's his name? In New York, the New Yorker authors. Uh, you know that better than I do. But the, the people, the the writers from New York, were in shock. <coughs> And they all change something in the writing. Or, uh, well. um, I think, I'm not sure if it was earlier in the French session or uh, yesterday, you mentioned that uh, your professors from Ecole Normale Supérieure, they were uh, criticizing your book once it became a bestseller, because once the bestseller is mm -hmm. no longer literature. Mm -hmm. So my question is, sure. what is literature to you? <laughs> what would be your personal definition of literature? Wow. <laughs> um, okay. Literature wants to change literature. Literature is a book that, that wants to make a change, you know, not, in, not necessarily in the world, but yes, it does, but also in the language, in, in literature itself. So there are many, many, many books that are outside literature, that they, because they don't want to change anything in literature. They just, you know, just want to be in bookshops. So I, when I write a book, I want to, to, I want to change something in the language. I want to, yeah, to move something in the language. It's very, it's very hard to say where, how, but I try, I try. And I, 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 I am very aware that I write with words more than ideas. That's why the plots I'm telling you, it's, it, wait until it's written, because it's all in the language. And, um, well. So, uh, writing method, do you want to share ideas about how you write? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. your strategies. There are those who like a uh, uh, map out <coughs> a beginning, middle, and an end. Or there are those who say, just 
let it flow and all of it. How do you write? Well, I'm this sort of writer who let it flow uh, and get into trouble sometimes because I, the flow is not enough, the energy is not enough. You also have to have a plot. But I, I, I'm not able to do a, 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 a plan. An, an outline. An outline. I'm, outline. Not, a, I'm not able to, to make an outline because if I know too much what's going to happen in the book, I get bored. Because I, I, I quoted Julien Green in the first session, he said, I write my books to know what's inside the book. I write my books to know what is in them. Oui, voilà. like that. <laughs> well, yeah. So, so I'm this sort of writer. I, I, I write my book also to read it. Um, and if I know too much, I, I get bored. So I, I have, but I have a, my workshop is very now. It's been years, so I know exactly how I do. Um, I, 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 I wait. I dream awake. I, at the moment, I dream about this novel. It's been one year that I dream about it. I read a lot. I, I, I see things. I, I see movies. I read books. I hear people. And it, and, and it, it, ça, it ça se construit dans ma tête. It, it becomes a book in my mind. Um, and at some point, I will have the first sentence. But in a way, I will hear it. I will hear it. And uh, and. And for, for example, at the moment, I still don't, I know it will be the, the, the woman's point of view, but I still don't know if I will write it in the first person or in the third person, which is very important. So I still don't know. I hesitate. One day I will have the first sentence and, and the person and the rhythm and the harmony and everything will be in that first sentence. And I will start and I will do a first draft. And as I told you in the first class, I... I, I I write it. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not thinking about anything else, about the readers, about the critics, about my old parents, about my young children, about my husband. I don't. I forget everything. I just write, and it's 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 fabulous that moment in general, and it lasts some months, and I write perhaps three hours a day, not not more, and then I I I go as far as I can. There's an ending, some of some sort. And then I, and very often it's on the, I, I write it with my hand, <laughs> and then I type it on the computer. And that's a big moment of depression because uh, this ideal book I had in my mind, I, it's not there. I mean, it's, it's, it's so, so I cut a lot, and, and, and anybody who writes knows this. So you cut, so you have holes everywhere, so you have to make transitions, and you move the chapters, and you move the paragraphs. It's a hell, but I love it. I really love it. So, and so I get completely obsessional, etc., etc., and that lasts for months again. And in the end, miraculously, I have some sort of manuscript, and I read it again and again and again, and at least I don't know, 20 times. And each reading has its function. And it, the very last reading is about, you know, commas, about yeah. really very precise things. And I, I'm, in the last readings, I try to hear the rhythm of, of the very first. You know this flow of energy. I I, 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 I check if it's still there, uh, and, I, and if it's not, I rewrite again. So it can last. In general, it takes at least at least um, one year and a half. Uh, the, the full process. A short a short answer to that might be. Uh, tell me if this is true, uh, and I'm sure people in this room feel the same way. There's some it, there's some things that are in your head that you. That, 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 that you have to write. That it, you have to write it yeah. because it, it won't go away. No, no. It, it, until, it, until you write it out. And there's some German um, writer who talked about uh, that with you know, the separable uh, prefixes. And in, in, in German, you can say Ausschrieben. And as, as so you can literally write it out so yeah. you get it out. Yeah, that's true. Who was the writer that you quoted that says I write so that I know what's in this book? Julien Green. Okay. Because that goes back to Montaigne. Montaigne says, you know, these, you ask me why I write these essays. Mm -hmm. Je les écris pour savoir ce que je pense. Oui. Uh, and Beckett, uh, yeah. I don't want to compare myself to him, but Beckett said when he was asked why do you write and he said bon ça. That's 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 all I'm good at. Uh, <laughs> bon ça. It's a short sentence. Okay. Well I think we are getting close. So <coughs> thank you so much everybody. Thank you. Thank you.